Warning, this video contains massive spoilers for Act 3 of Wano. If you are not up to date with Act 3, then I recommend you click that enticing subscribe button and come back to this video at a later date, because we are about to have a fascinating discussion here, and I simply could not bear the thought of you missing out. But with that warning out of the way, let's get into the video. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today I'd like to do a different kind of character examination than we usually perform on this channel, because a certain Kanjiro has recently been revealed as a filthy, filthy traitor, and in honor of his dickery, I would like to take a look back in the series to see if it really was obvious in retrospect, just as all justified Kanjiro theorists now claim. So essentially what we'll be doing here is going through the series chronologically from Kanjiro's initial appearance and seeing if we can identify some red flags, and I tell you right now, there are a lot of them, including his hair, which is almost like a literal red flag. Before we get started though, I do want to credit Arta of the Library of Ohara for putting together a fantastic compilation of quote unquote evidence that various individuals had put forward over the years regarding Kanjiro, and there will be a link to this in the description below, because it contains a lot of comprehensive stuff, some of which I was completely unaware of, but we will get into most of it. But to begin, our first appearance of Mr. Kanjiro would be chapter 700, which sees the straw hat sailing to dress Rosa and Kinemon recounting the tale of how Kanjiro sacrificed himself to allow Kinemon to escape, which is really interesting to see in retrospect because the straw hats have this over the top reaction of, oh, Kanjiro is a real man, let's go rescue him. So yeah, that, that kind of hurts looking back on it. And I wouldn't say that there's any red flags in this initial mentioning and a brief vague shaped flashback of him. However, Knowing what we know now, you could quite probably make the argument that everything that happened around this time was not necessarily due to natural forces, and Kanjiro could have been undermining the situation as best he could to fracture the vassals and find a place for himself to die. Pure speculation though, so let's keep going. Now the next mention of Kanjiro is simply Kinemon looking for him, believing him to be a prisoner in the House of Toys, which yeah, makes sense because he was captured, and the moment where we would finally meet him in the flesh is chapter 754, where Kinemon encounters Kanjiro in the dress rose a scrap heap. And here we also encounter our first red flag, which very simply put, is that Kanjiro's design is based on that of a kabuki actor, specifically from a dance piece entitled Renjishi, which translates as two lions. And if you wanted to be super wanky, which sometimes we do, you could read into that with ideas like, oh, Oda chose this design from this piece specifically because the title has that implied duality at play in Kanjiro. However, the very simple red flag is that he was given the design of an actor on a stage, implying that the Kanjiro we came to know and some of us came to love is nothing but a performance. We should also briefly discuss Kanjiro's situation at the time of his introduction because other things were happening in the world, specifically on Zo, where Jack was leading an assault on the Mink tribe, knowing that Raizo was there. And this was actually a big contributing factor to those individuals who believed that the traitor had to be a Mink because the entire tribe knew about Raizo, but then again, so did the ever sneaky Kanjiro. And connecting some dots, you can make the argument that Kanjiro revealed his identity to Doflamingo, which allowed him to get a message to Orochi, which may have been passed on to Kaido, and thus resulted in Jack being dispatched to claim Raizo on Zo. And after that, I don't think it's out of the question for Kanjiro to have said, all right, now that you know that, please throw me in a scrap heap and leave me to die. But when Kinemon appeared on Dress Rosa, Kanjiro sprang back into action once again because this was new information that Orochi Senpai simply needed to know. And further evidence to suggest that Kanjiro had contact with Doflamingo is that the Heavenly Demon was able to recognize both Kinemon and Momonosuke by face, which I actually don't think is a huge red flag with what we knew at the time because there was an assumption that they were general Wano fugitives and obviously Kaido would have put that information out into the world. But at this point, we obviously did not know that they had traveled through time. However, with what we know now, it would seem that Kanjiro more than likely drew Doflamingo a picture with perfect, realistic, artistic abilities. Now, speaking of his artistic prowess, Kanjiro is introduced to us holding a delightful ink cabbage, which is a panel that I quite enjoy, but it set off a train of thought within the One Piece community that may seem a bit crackpot, but hey, it panned out, which is that we should note that Kanjiro is holding the cabbage with his right hand. Now, with this in mind, cast your brain back to any time that Kanjiro has handled an object, such as when he was eating in the Odin flashback, and once again, he's using his right hand. However, when Kanjiro draws something as part of his Devil Fruit abilities, he seems to predominantly use his left hand. Because yeah, the brush requires both hands to use, but the main source of input is coming from the left, whilst the right hand is acting as a ballast. So it's such a small thing, but this is indeed a red flag, because with Kanjiro's fruit especially, maximum effect could only be achieved by a user invoking their dominant hand. So it would appear that he was purposely handicapping his artistic prowess, attempting to craft the worst possible assistance he could in any given situation to undermine the efforts of all involved. And you can see that at play during the rest of the Dressrosa arc as well, in which Kanjiro very much did the bare minimum to assist the crisis at hand. In fact, there was even one part where Zoro chastised both Kanjiro and Kinemon for not helping in terms of pushing back the birdcage. And this makes perfect sense with the now established character of Kanjiro, but this moment is not necessarily a red flag because 
Kinemon was in a similar state of inaction during the climax of Dressrosa. Now, a piece of what I'll call non-evidence that has also come up within theorists of Kanjuro is that he was noticeably absent from the bounties issued by Doflamingo with the star system and everything because Kinemon was given one. However, this is a real stretch because at the time, we had not even been introduced to Kanjuro. That moment wouldn't come until a full volume later and as Gladius said, apparently all they knew was that he had escaped from the scrap heap. But by this time, Kanjuro would have been old news. And even if he were a protagonist, then there still would have been no real reason for Doflamingo to insert him into this bounty offering, which was designed to deal with the immediate threat to his power, which Kanjuro, even if he was good guy, was not. But of course it does fit in quite nicely with what we know now, but at the time, yeah, it was a huge stretch to use this as evidence. But now we move to the island of Zo, and here is another situation in which Kanjuro's selectively poor art came to potentially impact everyone around him with the ever adorable and memorable dragon, which while cute enough to make Robin blush, was impractical to say the least. And not only that, but in one of the weirdest scenes I have ever seen in the series, there was this situation where a mink monkey fell from Zunisha, and for whatever reason, Kanjuro decided to put his hands over the eyes of Kinemon, which resulted in the monkey hitting them and all three of them falling from the dragon. Now, I remember when this chapter came out at the time and thinking that the scene was very strange because it just didn't make a whole lot of sense. The narrative flow was really odd and Kanjuro's actions were just bizarrely foolish. And to be completely honest with you, after the Zoark, it looked like it was a poorly implemented excuse for Oda to create some drama by delaying the arrival of the samurai. However, in greater retrospect, this scene makes perfect sense because it is Kanjuro working to sabotage Kinemon by preventing him as best he could from meeting up with the Minx, Momonosuke, and Raizo. It was, of course, a poorly thought out plan and one that was only going to delay the inevitable, but an act of sabotage nonetheless. And when they do eventually reach the top of Zunisha, Kanjuro further says that their journey was one of many trials and travails, which could be referring simply to everything that they had been through after leaving Wano, but it also might imply that while scaling the elephant, Kanjuro continued to act foolishly and undercut Kinemon's efforts. That line can be taken either way, but it's just interesting. And yes, I guess you can consider all of his shenaniganry a big red flag because this behavior was just so suspicious out of context. Hindsight is 2020 though, and my own feelings on this at the time was that this was just a goofy Kanjuro move because he's a very weird fellow, as was every citizen of Wano that we'd met at the time, and so it didn't seem all that out of place to me. But then again, I'm a fool. Furthermore, if you really want to analyze the Zo events, and we do, when Inorashi and Nekomomushi announced that Raizo was safe, we received a shocked reaction from just about everyone, including the Straw Hat members present, as well as some dedicated focus to the citizens of Zo. But there were two reactions that we did not receive, one of which was Kanjuro. After the announcement that Raizo was safe, we don't see his face at all, at least not in the manga. I honestly forget what the anime decided to do with it, but this is another one of those retrospective weirdities, because at this stage, Raizo is known as a very close comrade, and you would think that this would call for some form of emotional reaction from Kanjuro like we do see with Kinemon. So in this case, Oda chose to leave Kanjuro out of this equation, possibly strategically, but to counter this point, Momonosuke was also present for this event and he did not receive a reaction shot either, which using my own argument against me would have been called for. So yes, if you're overanalyzing things, this is a bit of a red flag, but it's not the strongest one we have at all. And furthermore, I think Kanjuro very effectively solidified his perception of innocence when everyone broke down discussing Kozuki Odin. And that was when the group were taken to see the Roponoglyph. And if you've got the idea that he's an actor in mind, as characterized through his design, then this is meaningless improving his innocence. But if you're not looking at things with that perspective, then this is a nice scene to really throw you off the scent, as does the rest of Zo, where he appears as a semi-regular dude bruh. And with that, we must go all the way to the Wano arc now. And here we have a slew of what I guess I would call circumstantial evidence, such as Kanjuro being one of the few people privy to hearing the conversation of Hiori being alive and the general plotting of the operation. But there is a really, really interesting panel that was brought to my attention recently, which comes from chapter 970, where we see a flashback of Kinemon and company after just being sent forward in time. And behind this group, we see two trademark Kanjuro birdies flying off in the distance, which is a supremely suspicious and definite red flag. Because we know now that these messages are likely headed straight to Orochi, although I'm not sure why there are two, maybe one was sent to Kaido and Onigashima to be safe, but this panel actually has me sort of mind blown. Now, I will say that in the anime version of this event, Kinemon and everyone else fall from the sky, and the first thing Kinemon sees is three birds flying above him, rather than the two we see in the background of the manga. So the anime really does its best to render these birds as meaningless flavor to the scene, and quite possibly as an excuse for a couple of seconds of filler. Meaning that even the director likely believed that it was an insignificant factor, or to look at things from the flip side, they thought that there was no way they could convincingly do it without completely giving away the game. Because there is evidence to suggest that the animation team are privy to these little secrets, as we have examined a couple of times in the over-the-top opening. 
where for example, Kyoshiro is included in the montage of the scabbards long, long before he was revealed to be Dendro in the manga. But in retrospect, there is a second spoiler in this opening, as when we see Kandro, he is notably the only scabbard depicted turning his back on the camera. And as much as I really don't want to read into openings too much, because yes, yeah, some of them are artistically structured down to very minor poses, but others are full of more arbitrary presentations that are just a waste of time. But in this case, it is super hard to deny that it looks like Kandro was set up as the traitor in this opening. So that would have been a very late stage red flag for us, which many of us should have paid attention to, especially if we were on the Kyoshiro Dendro bandwagon as a result of this opening alone. And now something else that I wasn't even aware of was pointed out by the Library of Ohara, which is that Kandro's status was also potentially hinted in outside media, quite specifically the One Piece Vivia card data book. Now Kandro was featured as part of the Dressrosa pack, which makes sense because that's the arc in which he was introduced, but Dressrosa was so chocked full of characters that this set had to be divided into two. And how was this divide chosen? Well, there was a Corridor Coliseum pack and a Don Quixote family pack, the former of which features pretty much every ally on Dressrosa, and the latter features pretty much every enemy on the island. And guess which pack our friend Kandro features in? Yes, it's the Don Quixote family pack. So yes, that is another potential red flag, but once again, I will point out that there is another mark of interest here, which is that Kuros also features in the Don Quixote family pack. So this could very easily be a situation where we just had these two characters who, you know, didn't really fit anywhere else and were stuffed in here. Although in Kandro's case, it has come to make perfect sense, even if it was incidental. And there's even much more quote unquote evidence that people have brought up in relation to Kandro, much of which I think is sketchy, although some of it is just plain interesting. So if you are keen to hear more, then please do check out my link to the Library of O'Hara's information in the description. But in essence, I would like to offer my congratulations to everybody who relentlessly suspected Kandro because you were bang on the money. In retrospect, his role in the series is absurdly suspicious. However, I do think that Oda did a great job of masking it through portraying Kandro as a generally quirky individual, which for most of us, including me, I think served as a very easy answer to his exceptionally weird behavior. But what do you guys think? Feel free to leave your thoughts on Kandro in the comments below, or even join my Discord server. And if you're keen for more One Piece content, then please do check out some of my other videos, or even subscribe to the channel for regular One Piece phenomenality uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. But for now, this has been the Ground Line Review, and I'll see you next time.